everyone, my name is Malte. I'm a chief architect at Vercel, and today I want to talk about ultra low latency rendering on the edge. We at Vercel think that the web will be edge first. What that means is that there's people around the world, they want to talk to the internet, and the closer the internet is to them, the better that works. Um, but to get to that like endpoint of edge first, I want to do a very quick run through to how serving on the web actually works. So this first model is probably very familiar. You have a user somewhere and they talk to a web server and that's how we build websites, you know, 1994 and it hasn't changed since and this still works. It's, it's, it's not bad. Um, but then, you know, people were like, ah, you know, running your own web servers. It's a troubled thing. You know, who wants to do that? Let's let's put them in the cloud. So and this is the same model. It's just someone else's computer, right? Now you're talking to, you know, some computer in Virginia and, and it does the job. Same model as before. Now that still means you have to like upgrade your web server. You still have to like turn it back on if it crashes, all, all that kind of jazz. That's not so great. Um, and that's when we started to do serverless computing, which is roughly the same model. There's still a computer somewhere, but you no longer manage it. You don't manage the web server on it. You put the program on it. You put the files on it. And then some other entity, you know, is actually managing the delivery of that content to the user. This is definitely an easier to manage model, but it's still kind of the same idea that there's a, you know, managed computer somewhere in some data center and you're talking to it. Now the final topic and the topic of this talk is an evolution of serverless where that compute, that managed compute happens on the edge. And on the edge means it's very close to the user, right? And so that's the that's the big step forward, which promises, and obviously that's really important for the P9 here in conference, to have much lower latency to that user's connection. All right. So let's talk about what it means to be on the edge. Let's Take, and we'll use this example for the rest of this presentation. Um, let's take a user and they're in Tokyo, right, in Japan. And, you know, if you're in Tokyo right now, that might be you. If you're not in Tokyo, it doesn't matter. Anywhere on the planet, there's a user. And now in those three models that we talked about that don't have the compute on the edge, whenever you want to talk to a data center that has maybe some data, um, you need to make a connection to that, right? I'd like to make the joke that all compute is in Virginia. It's where you know the biggest data centers are, especially for Amazon, um, Google, Microsoft, etc., are, are right next door. Um, so I, you know, I like to think about edge computing as this world, and there's a user in Tokyo, and there's a data center in Virginia, and 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 we're talking between them. Now, okay, so this is the the standard setup. You can imagine that if you don't have to go all the way from Tokyo to Virginia, that speeds things up quite a bit because you're already in this like order of magnitude of distance where speed of light matters quite a bit. All right. So I talked about location in terms of, of edge computing. The next aspect is that it's it's not only that. Okay. So the serverless computing model is still very flexible. It allows you to run all kinds of different computers with a lot of flexibility. Um, that means that when you do that, you have to like literally you know, spin up this micro VM, turn on your computer program, et cetera, that might take a while. And edge computing typically puts in more constraints, which makes that compute cheaper. It reduces the, the, the duration of those called start times, but there are trade-offs in terms of flexibility. Usually it means that you can't just run whatever you want. Um, what it in practice really means is that your options are typically JavaScript or TypeScript or Wasm. Like those are typically the things that can be run on the edge in these very managed compute uh, containers um, that kind of trade off flexibility cost versus um, and, and code startup time, like around those, those trade offs. Okay. Now, that all sounds great, right? We have cheaper compute, faster code start times, some flexibility trade offs, the closer to your users, that's great. Um, but there are some challenges, and that's really the, the, the topic of this talk today. All right. So, what are these? these challenges. To understand what they are, we need to talk a little bit about how, you know, in the modern world, web pages are actually made. Um, there's basically two strategies we're going to 
take a look at them really quick. The first kind of strategy, it's like two names. It's either static site generation or incremental site generation. Um, the latter is when, you know, the, fi the, the file can change over time, but really it's, it's a static file that you serve the user. So what this really means is that it's the same as the gold old HTML file is just on the web server. The only difference here being that, um, you know, there's some smart generation logic happening. And obviously that's like super fast. It's very cheap to operate. There's just this file, but it's very hard to personalize. So that static site generation, on the other hand, we have the ultra flexible server side rendering, which just means that the HTML responses are generated on the fly, um, which means also that personalization just works, right? Every user gets a fresh page, you know, and obviously that's like that's the perfect version for personalization because everyone gets something special. Um, but traditionally, when you do server-side rendering, you only do it in the core data centers where you actually have compute that can perform that rendering. All right. So what happens if we take these, you know, rendering strategies and put them on the edge? Once again, as a reminder, we have our user in Tokyo and we have our core data center in Virginia. For this talk, we're imagining that's the only one we have. Now, um, let's imagine we're doing a server-side render, right? Because we want that personalization. In the traditional model, you know, this is how it looks. We have the user making a request, and because there's, you know, speed of light challenges and we have to go both ways, Let's just imagine for the sake of this presentation that it takes 150 milliseconds, which I don't think is particularly unlikely that, you know, you'll end up with something that order of magnitude. Now, adding, um, you know, a request, um, like channeling this through the edge means we're adding this extra layer. And um, now, what is a very common problem is that we still need to go from the edge to the core data center because that's where our data is, right? So it's typically not very easy to transport it to the edge, and we'll talk a little bit about this later in the talk, but um, what you end up having is a situation where you go from the user to the edge, and obviously it's a very you know, low latency connection, that's great, and, but we still have to go to the core data center. Now, maybe you think, okay, why would we ever do the edge rendering case in this case? But there are still some benefits. Like, for example, you might be able to do a streaming render and respond with the first bytes much faster after 10 milliseconds rather than like waiting all the way, doing all the long trip to Virginia to do any form of response. So this might be a system that still makes sense, right? But it's easily you know, visible that already, you know, you're from excited, we can talk to the edge in 10 milliseconds to like, ah, I still have to go to Virginia. What's the point, right? Unfortunately, it actually gets worse. Um, with the like big old problem of any form of low latency computing, which is when we are introducing waterfalls, right? So in the example that I was just showing, we have we had the latency with only one bit of data that we needed from Virginia, right? And so obviously just go back and forth. Super easy. Now, if we need two pieces of data and then for the sake of this example, we imagine they're non-concurrent. I have to like, maybe for example, I first check, are you locked in? And then I'm coming back and I'm saying, okay, now that I know you're locked in, I can actually get the data, right? It's a very common setup. And what we'll get is this, right? So we now have to go from the edge to Virginia twice, which adds 150 milliseconds twice. And, you know, some quick math, that's 300 milliseconds. So we now regressed performance, although we did our wonderful edge computing, by double, right? Which is very bad. And, you know, obviously this just sums up. Imagine you have three, you're at 450 milliseconds, right? That's just already, you know, you can't even talk about it anymore. So what do you do, right? So clearly you can't just move stuff to the edge very naively. You have to um, do something smarter than that. All right. Um, let's talk about a few strategies that we can do to make this work. Now, the the most obvious one, and probably everything, like everyone here was screaming at their screen, like, why don't you put the data to the closer to the user, right? And obviously you can do that, right? Why not? So imagine you have this edge data store. It's maybe even smaller than 10 milliseconds away from the edge. So you get these like ultra fast responses, right? That's that's the dream. And 
you know, if, if you can do that, more power to you. It's going to be an amazing experience. And but let's talk about like when that is good, right? I, I imagine this is like great for what's in my shopping cart. Because obviously, like that data only needs to be close to the user. It's the user's data. Why don't we put it on the edge, right? But it might not be so great for the question like, is this product available? Because we need to have global consistency on that answer, right? And so maybe for that, we once again need to go back to Virginia. So my thesis is that this is an amazing strategy, but it's just not going to happen for some data, right? Like, and there could be so many reasons for this, but most likely it's just that your business has some data in some system and it's been there for a long time and it's going to be there for a long time and you're not going to put it to Tokyo if it's not already in Tokyo, right? Like it's going to stay in, in your, your small set of data centers where you already have it. And the project to change that is so big that it's unlikely to happen. Okay, so we have a strategy here. It's amazing, but it doesn't apply for every use case. Uh, what can we do instead? Now, this might be a bit of a weird solution because edge computing sounds so much like something we would do to in terms of a location, being close to user. But I think this is actually kind of attractive where we move compute to the other edge. So the edge actually isn't in Tokyo anymore. It's in Virginia now, right? Um, and, you know, I mean, that makes our, our, our graphic here very simple. They're basically both the same. Um, we, we have effectively this, like, variant on the core data center strategy. It's maybe not completely obvious why you would possibly do this. Um, but again, looking back at like some of the benefits of, of edge computing, it's that within those trade-offs and flexibility, which totally might mean you can't use it, but if you can use it, you get cheaper compute, you get faster startup times, right? But obviously, if you put the edge compute near the data and supposed to near to the user, you get no wins from being close to user. So maybe not the perfect strategy for low latency, but it might be the right strategy for having cheaper compute and the faster startup time, which obviously does impact latency in some situations. Okay, the final strategy I want to talk about is separating rendering compute from front-end compute. Here, we kind of think about how the process of rendering a page actually happens. I would argue that there's really two things. There's a rendering step and there is a data fetching step. And let's think about the possibility of splitting those two things into two different compute units and running them in different locations. In this case, you actually have two edge computing payloads, workloads. One of them is the edge rendering step, which is the one that's close to the user. And the other one is the edge data fetching step, which is close to the data, right? So what are you getting out? First example, once again, we have, you know, the user, we have the edge rendering, and we have edge at core data center. And we're sticking to that 10 millisecond till, till we be able to, so turn time first byte versus 150 millisecond to get to the data center. Obviously, it'll stay the same, but it doesn't really matter how many non-concurrent data fetches we make. It stays at 150 milliseconds. Right? And so what we get with this strategy is that we can flush edge responses in milliseconds. So we get the super, super fast 10 millisecond uh, latency to the user, but we avoid the latency increases to the waterfalls. Right? And so we kind of get the best of both worlds where we can respond at absolute minimum latency, but we also can avoid the, the impact of waterfalls. Awesome. So this is basically what I wanted to talk about. Right. So Edge computing is exciting, but the naive approach doesn't really yield really good results if you have centralized data, right? Which I think is a very common um, prop problem space. Um, in this talk, we offered three solutions that can produce good outcomes. Which one you need to use really depends on your particular situation, right? And in particular, the automatic splitting of compute units based on their perfect uh, location is what yields truly outcome, uh, great outcomes. Awesome. So we have a website, versal.com slash edge. That's where you can find out how you can do this in our platforms. Obviously, there's more of them. Um, and that's all I had today. 
Again, my name is Malta. You can find me on Twitter under Kremforce. And thank you very much. Thank you.